Surprise, mother- Hey, what's up, YouTube? It's your boy, Wes. All right, so I literally had to amend this review because I somehow made the mistake of not making this review go live on my channel two whole weeks ago. So instead, now this is a double chapter review of chapter 94 and 95. So yeah, be sure to stick around for the review of chapter 95. All right, let's get into it. Folks, we have officially reached the conclusion to Hoshina and Kaiju number 10's battle with Kaiju number 12. I'm excited to see exactly how much our boy and his pet Kaiju can grow from here. I just know for sure that eventually number 12 will be along for the ride. Don't believe me? Then pay attention to the fact that Matsumoto didn't draw Kaiju number 12's core completely destroyed like he did with Kaiju number 15, nor did he show the remains evaporating into thin air like he did for number 11. I'm gonna put 100 on Kaiju number 12, becoming a weapon of some sort for Hoshina to wield later on. Like I've been saying for the past few months, maybe not a numbers weapon suit, but definitely some kind of specialty made sword or swords of some sort. That seems to be the running theme for Hoshina. So I expect him to wield some kind of bladed weapon created from the remains of Kaiju number 12 in the future. We have to acknowledge how powerful number 12 must have been. I mean, to find the strength to regenerate an arm even after his core was pierced, there is no way else to say it. Kaiju number 12 has that dog in him. He just fell flat out with a lingering smile on his face. Like he was literally ready to get up and just go back at it again. I'm being careful about saying that he died because that's just the thing. I don't believe number 12 is truly dead, but I enjoyed Hoshina keeping the theme of a Bushido and paying his respects to number 12 regardless of being his enemy. As for Kaiju number 10, Hoshina is understandably exhausted and right when he's grounded on his back, number 10 goes right into trying to fight the other officers again. That is peak Kaiju number 10. He just wants all the smoke, has no chill, and I absolutely love him for it. He's officially become a favorite of mine and I can't wait to see what antics he gets up to with Hoshina as the series progresses. Thankfully, we get some minor information about Hoshina's older brother, Soichiro. Now we have somewhat of a clearer picture on where their relationship stands currently. It seems like Hoshina and his brother aren't really estranged or on seriously bad terms. It's more like their respective positions in the Japanese Defense Force keeps them from having any time to really interact with each other. But even then, when pressed by a fellow officer on why he doesn't contact Hoshina over the radio to send him his regards and support, you can see with tears in his eyes that he is genuinely relieved to hear about his brother's success, revealing that Hoshina really hates his gut <laughs> because of how much he picked on him as a kid, but that's just the nature of having an older brother. I would like to see these two on panel together at the same time, but I honestly don't know what's going to happen to him. This could very well take a dark turn because before Soichiro can finish his conversation, his radio goes off. This was played off very subtle in the chapter, but it's actually a very big occurrence. The operator on the radio makes it very clear that a new identified monster, aka base monster, aka Daikaiju, has just emerged in the, this name is a mouthful, the Nishiyashiro Cho area, which isn't one of the current locations of any of the five Daikaiju we've been presented with thus far. We have a new Daikaiju entering the battlefield and Captain Soichiro and his entire platoon are going straight to meet it head on. I really hope he doesn't get himself killed because number nine ain't playing no games. He's gonna roll out his strongest forces over time as he sees fit. Just like you, I'm thinking of the possibility of the Nishiyashiro Cho Daikaiju is what I'm gonna call it for now being the white luminous supergiant class Daikaiju that was revealed back in chapter 68. And if it is, then cool. But don't forget that other than that luminous Daikaiju, there are seemingly two more Daikaiju that are unaccounted for. Those two being the Kaiju that left the craters in the mountains of Hotuko City and the one that emptied out the oil tanks in Chiba City. Based off of this bit of information, I suspect that one of those kaiju will be a fire-based kaiju, particularly the one that completely drained out massive oil tanks while leaving barely any trace of its existence behind. And if that's the case, some of y'all probably already know what I'm thinking. 
a Daikaiju with Dominion over Fire comes with the potential to finally see Reno rocking Numbers Weapon 6 again. Reno has been missing in action for longer than Kafka has this arc, and he's the freaking secondary protagonist. Like, I'm serious, it's been well over a year and some months now, in real time, since we've last seen him make an appearance, dog. That is absolutely insane to think about. I know we've got Mina versus Kaiju number 14 up next, but uh, Matsumoto, let me see the homie Reno for at least a panel or two. A potential fire and ice matchup could happen, and that's just hype. I am so excited to see if it happens the way I think it can. Anyway, speaking of Mina and Kaiju number 14, it's finally time to see what this powerhouse of a woman can actually do. We've seen everyone, and I mean everyone, bow down and smoke Mina Ashiro's pack, but we've yet to really learn that much about her other than aspects of her personality. Since every battle with the Daikaiju thus far has been glorified therapy sessions for our protagonists, yes, that is a meme going around in the community and it's, it's partially true, I'm not gonna lie, then I am expecting to see something similar happen with Mina. Is that predictable? Yes, but it's good because it's sorely needed for her character in order to have her evolve. The outlook of her battle with number 14 is pretty interesting. Tachikawa is home base for Division 3, so Mina actually has multiple reinforcements at her disposal. Tachikawa base has ground and air forces on deck, but Kaiju number 14 is like, nah, catch this AOE fam, and <laughs> pretty much decimates the surrounding area doing a 360 laser spin. Draw your attention to the face that number 14 made as it was firing the lasers, right? Peep the tears in its eyes. That is creepy as all hell, man. I'm wondering if every face attached to its body is some sort of representation of a different human emotion. It seems to have about four faces total. So maybe each face gives access to a unique ability. Kaiju number 14 has shielding that it can project around its body as well as short range teleportation on top of its laser beams. So clearly this thing was properly set up by number nine to be a threat to Mina specifically. I mean, when you think about it, she is a sniper. Number nine knows this and Kaiju number 14's entire skill set seems to be based around hard countering sniper opponents. The laser beam instantly halts the guerrilla tactics that you would see most snipers employ. She can't simply take her shot and then quickly reposition herself when number 14 can just spin around and literally destroy the entire area regardless. She also can't hit a teleporting target with her railgun, Kronos, considering how long it takes to reload and then recharge. So that's also on a back burner for now. And even then she has to figure out a way to contend with the barrier that number 14 can release seemingly at will. So the cards are not completely stacked in her favor. And I like that in my Shonen battle manga. Like I said earlier, I'm willing to bet that each of number 14's four faces gives it access to a different skill, which implies that there is a fourth skill that has yet to have been revealed. Whatever it is though, we know it's going to be an absolute pain for a sniper fighter to have to deal with. Let me know what you guys think that ability could possibly be because the only thing I can come up with is potentially invisibility, maybe? The winning ticket to this fight might lie in destroying one of its four faces, which I would imagine might hopefully disable one of its abilities. If that's actually how Kaiju number 14's powers happen to work. That being said, it seems like Mina is about to break the typical mold of a traditional sniper and get up close and personal with Bako. Yes, I peeped the Akira slide and yes, it was one of the slickest moments in this manga thus far. I'm curious to know more about Bako too. We know Mina has a thing for cats as shown during her childhood flashback. We know that she lost a cat in her neighborhood to a kaiju attack and that ended up being a triggering factor for her joining the defense force. A theory of mine is that Bako is some type of physically enhanced feline infused with the cells of some random unknown kaiju. That's a very likely possibility. It would help to explain how Bako can assist Mina with taking down smaller size kaiju and have enough strength to stabilize her body after the recoil from firing her sniper. 
All right, so now on to chapter 95. I like how the second page of the chapter is a callback to the cover of chapter 31 with a younger Kafka standing beside his present day self. The theme of that chapter was how even through the passage of time, Kafka's conviction to exterminate all of the Kaiju remained unchanged. It was this very same chapter in which Kafka's true nature was exposed for the world to see. He was willing to completely sacrifice his future in the Defense Force and his dream of ever standing by Mina's side as they defend the people they love from Kaiju, all to make sure that Kaiju number 10's Kaiju bomb didn't completely vaporize Tachikawa base and everyone around it. Much like chapter 31, chapter 95 is also themed around Mina Ashiro's conviction to exterminate all Kaiju being unshaken and the mental toll that task takes on her to get the job done. So both covers have a bit of a parallel meaning and are drawn to reflect the content within them. The chapter begins with a flashback of Mina's Defense Force entrance exam, and she is said to be 18 at this point in time. So that puts Kafka at 23 years old, since he's about five years her senior. One of the best things to come out of this flashback, besides seeing Kafka showing moral support for his childhood friend, is the fact that it answers a question that the community has been asking for a minute now. Some people were wondering exactly how many times did Kafka make an attempt to join the Defense Force. This whole time, we hadn't gotten any clarification on that. The most we got was him saying that he just gave up. There wasn't any dialogue that expressed just how often he attempted to join the Defense Force, only that he failed and moved on. In this flashback, we learn that Kafka made this attempt at least four times prior to this flashback, meaning he attempted the entrance exam once every year for five years. This explains so much about Kafka's mental state in the very beginning of the manga. Imagine being told year after year for five plus years, because remember, we don't know exactly how many more times Kafka kept trying, that you cannot accomplish your dream, that you simply aren't fit for the job, that you aren't cut out for this life. Go try your luck elsewhere, my boy. But even still, Kafka was able to show up and put a smile on his face and tell Mina to never give up, that we need to get back up and try again should we fall. That is peak wholesomeness, and that is exactly why I love Kafka Hibino's character. Ultimately, we know how that turned out for him, he failed the exam, but was still able to put a smile on his face that hides his frustration. Even though I knew what was coming, man, that was still hard to see go down. Even Mina, who had to witness him grit his teeth and smile, was visibly saddened by his reaction. Remember that she sees right through him. In chapter 69, she states that even when Kafka is afraid, he would put on a smile that puts her at ease. So yeah, she definitely saw past that fake smile. While we got some good insight into Kafka's past, this chapter is primarily focusing on Kafka's presence in Mina's life, or lack thereof, depending on how you look at it later on. The focal, focal point of this chapter, if that's even a thing, is exactly how much pressure and responsibility the Defense Force put on Mina when she was barely an adult. In her first training exam at the firing range, she showed a ridiculous aptitude for projectile weaponry, as shown by the damage she was able to cause to the training field. You see, she was meant to shoot a hole through the targets that were positioned for her, like everyone else in the exam. The bigger the hole in the target, the more output you have for gun weaponry. Mina was only expecting to shoot a small hole through her target, but in reality, Mina is her and everyone else around her are scrubs by comparison, as evidenced by the freaking Kamehameha X Rasengan X Reversal Red she shot from her gun. This prompted the scientists within the DF to run as many tests on Mina as possible to figure out how she could be outputting such immense never before seen power. To the point where they've got the girl freaking out. This was supposed to be her first day training and here everyone is huddled around her running test after test telling her she's abnormal. She even has the boss man Iseo, Shinomiya, and Itami simping for her. Both of them are starting to make me think she's like the Gojo of the Kaijuverse. Neither of them have ever felt power like this before, causing Iseo to call Mina Ashiro the missing link, stating that Kaiju neutralization will never be the same again. You can kind of see some of the obsession that Iseo has with finding someone who's capable of completely obliterating Kaiju, especially after his wife lost her life to Kaiju number six. 
This visibly freaks Mina out as she wonders what's going to happen to her now, wishing that she had Kafka by her side. This chapter makes you question some of the Defense Force's methods as art really and boy do I mean really begins to imitate life. The very next thing they do is incredibly inconsiderate, but also quite realistic and accurate. <laughs> These clowns decide to strap a giant gun into the hands of a young teenage trainee and task her with neutralizing a monster the size and scale of which very few captains can do alone. Captains, man all the while disregarding the fact that she is a literal noob and has to deal with the absolute insane level of pressure that comes with that. When countless allies become injured or die in the process of setting her up for the right moment to shoot the target. And in her own words, if my strength isn't enough, then these people's sacrifices will be in vain. But wait, because that's not even the kick in the gut for this poor girl. Nope, the kick in the gut is when she remembers Kafka's promise to be by her side when she's faced with a powerful kaiju, only to not be there behind her, watching her back when she needed him most. You can question whether or not he should have made that promise to begin with, but remember, he was a naive kid at the time, so cut him some slack. He definitely should have kept in contact with her, though, because she is going through it. We don't get to see the outcome of her sniping the kaiju, but I would imagine that she was able to get the job done. But in spite of that, her disappointment in Kafka's broken promise remained as she continued to participate in subjugation after subjugation as the years went by until present day. It's important to point out that her disappointment in Kafka is not that he failed, it's that he failed and gave up. And by extension, she feels that he basically gave up on being there to have her back when she needed him. There's layers to the whole calling him a liar thing. Her problem is not that he didn't join the defense force to slay Kaiju. It's that I'm scared. You said you'd be here. Now you no longer want to be here. We learn that even now she's still scared whenever the responsibility of slaying a strong Kaiju is foisted upon her. The lives of all of her friends and even civilians are in her hands. Every time she takes aim carries the potential for her to fail to shoot her target. And by extension, that means another handful of her comrades' lives would be lost as a result. Yo, this is giving me a Final Fantasy VIII throwback to Irvine Kinnis. If you know, you know. Sharpshooters are known to experience immense pressure and stress when it comes to sniping a target in high stakes situations. So I like how Matsumoto is carefully weaving some of those aspects and the overall thought process of a professional sniper into Mina's character. During the present battle, Mina is biding her time, listening into the radio communications as the troops under her leadership give number 14 their all in order to give Mina the perfect opportunity to counterattack. Fortunately, the analysis by the DF's operators come through and they have deduced Kaiju 14's teleportation pattern. After every teleport, Mina has a stupidly small two second window to shoot out its center where its core is suspected to be. However, number 14 catches on to the trap that's being laid and takes a shot at Mina's position. This leads to the coolest moment I think I've seen her have in this manga so far. Thanks to Bako, she manages to dodge number 14's laser beam, which reasonably scares the crap out of it. Like look at its face. Surprise, mother <laughs> forcing it to teleport its position again. However, little does 14 know, Mina is now aware of the basic rules of its teleportation. So she instantly fires a shot once the teleportation is over, and in that small two second window, manages to blast clean through the center of Kaiju 14's body. Now for the elephant in the room, was Kaiju number 14 just destroyed? No, probably not, but I've been throwing around a theory in my head that Amina is eventually going to be ambushed by Kaiju number 9 at some point because of the sheer level of power she possesses and the high threat level she poses to 9's plans. So maybe 14 is defeated if Matsumoto quickly goes that route next chapter, but I'm leaning more towards number 14 still having some fight left in it once the dust settles a bit. Again, don't ask me how I forgot to upload my review for chapter 94 previously. I thought it went live on YouTube and it didn't. So uh, yeah, I was forced to turn this into a double chapter review. Anyways, that about wraps up this review. 
Let me know what you guys think in the comments. And if you like this kind of content, click the thumbs up and consider subscribing. Also hit the bell to stay notified when I drop more content such as this. All right, I'll catch you guys on the next video. God bless. Peace.